two men that were both uh, in their mid-90s, uh, 95, good Catholics. And they were, um, they were professional baseball players, like the Dodgers and the Red Sox. No? <laughs> and it turned out that uh, they're good practicing Catholics, and uh, they were getting close to the end of the ball game in ninth inning. They were both in their 90s, no? <laughs> they wanted to know if there's baseball in heaven. What do you think? Yeah. So they made a deal. Whoever went first would come back and tell the other <laughs> if there were baseball in heaven. So within a week, the guy that was 96 died. Uh, so his friend was making a novena for him, praying nine days in a row. After the ninth day, he appeared to his friend and said, you know, good news and bad news. Good news is that there is baseball in heaven. Bad news is you're pitching tonight. <laughs> so the, the next days are pretty tense for those who live in California and those who live in Boston, huh? <laughs> Okay, let's, uh, let's uh, dive into our topic. What I'd like to do, with your permission, I'd like to give you a brief summary of um, last week, specifically one day. Last week you're, you were contemplating the, the life of Christ, begging for intimate knowledge of Jesus, that you love him more ardently and you follow him more closely that was the grace that you're begging for. And the means by which we tried to flesh this out was that of the contemplation of the public life of Christ, the luminous mysteries, which John Paul II in the year 2002 incorporated into the, into the mysteries of the rosary. I'd always thought that uh, there was a missing link because in the rosary they're going from the crib to the cross. But what about the public life? If you know the Bible, you know the, the private life of Christ and the passion, death, and resurrection is about 70%, or 30, 30%. What about the other 70%, which would be the public life of Christ? So JP2, whose feast day we celebrated a couple of days ago, 22nd, uh, inspired by the Holy Spirit, incorporated a new series called the Luminous Mysteries. And they are the baptism of our Lord, the wedding feast of Cana, the proclamation of the kingdom, the call of the conversion, the transfiguration, and the institution of the Holy Eucharist. So that was your last week. How'd it go? Hello? Anyone home? You're somewhat taciturn this evening, okay? Taciturn means quiet, okay? Yeah. Uh, hopefully it was the best week in your, in your life, falling in love with Christ. Can't go wrong in that, right? Mm -hmm. But I'd like, to put, uh, I'd like to put the cream on the cake. That's a way of speaking for, I'd like to re re just revisit the last mystery, which is the institution of the Eucharist. Now, um, as a priest and a preacher, you can never talk too much about the Eucharist. I say this as a, as a priest, a preacher, a catechist, a missionary, but also lay people. You can never talk too much about the Eucharist if you know how to speak about the Eucharist, okay? If you have a Catholic understanding of what the Eucharist is. Because that is the, the most sublime gift in the whole universe. The Eucharist. I just finished celebrating Mass, so I have the Lord beating within my heart right now. What a gift. You know, when I was uh, preparing to become a priest, I had a, a, a confessor and I said, Father, I'm not, I'm not worthy to be a priest. I'll be a brother. I'm not worthy. 
And he said, you know, it's not so much being worthy or not, it was whether or not God called you. God qualifies the unqualified, so to speak. No? So if he calls you, he's going to give you the corresponding grace. If you like your sports image, God is not going to call you to run the 100 and 95 and, and shoot your foot with a rifle. I mean, God is going to give you the wings to, to fly and to run the 9.5 and the 100, right? So God is never going to ask us to do something that he will not give us the corresponding graces to come out, to carry out. So I said, well, Father, if that's your case, then I'll become a priest. And, and six years later, I was ordained by John Paul II. No, thanks be to God, okay? But the Mass, you know, I think even, even the best of us here were just touching the very, the very, you might say, the very tip of the iceberg in understanding what the Eucharist is. So I think I'd like to kind of finish uh, talking about that, and then we'll move into this next, next week. I'd like to... Um, tell you about the life of a saint to illustrate the, the love we should have for the Eucharist. Because the graces that come from the Eucharist are in direct proportion to our preparation. In theology is called the, the grace of disposition or the dispositive grace. What does that mean? The better the preparation, the better disposition, the more abundant the graces. <coughs> An example would be, okay, you come to Mass uh, five minutes late. During the Mass, you're thinking about what you're going to have for dinner. Okay? Then you receive communion. Then you leave Mass before the final blessing. Okay, you receive the Eucharist. You're not in mortal sin. You know, something happened there. Or you come an hour before the Mass and you make your holy hour. You're participating fully, actively, consciously in Mass. After Mass, you pray the Rosary, the Chapel of Divine Mercy, and you have a heart-to-heart -heart conversation with Jesus. Huge difference. Huge difference. It's the same sacrament, but two different dispositions. So, the fault is not in the sacrament, but in the recipient of the sacrament, namely yours truly. So there's a danger that we, we can fall into the rut in receiving the Lord, in other words, we take him for granted. Probably about half of you people here, about half of you, are married. <coughs> Maybe less, but those who are married, who will be married, one of the biggest dangers is you take your spouse for granted. We can take the Lord for granted, too. But in the, as the poet says, in the absence of the loved one, we love the loved one more, all the more. When we encounter the loved one, if you want a poetic expression. Okay? The absence of the loved one. We love the loved one all the more when we encounter him. I'll give an example. You go to daily mass, you drive in your car, you got the music on, the air conditioning, and you're, sup, you're, you're, you're maybe sipping Coca-Cola Coca when you're going to Mass. Or Juan Diego walking 10 miles to arrive at the Mass, and when he's 56 years old, so he's walking maybe about five hours through the cactus and through the desert, which you think is the person will appreciate the Mass all the more? You got the gist? <clears throat> so he's making that huge sacrifice, and that happened to Juan Diego. He's going to appreciate the, the Mass much more. You're sitting there in your car, sipping Coca-Cola, you know, popping M&Ms in your mouth, and 
with uh, the Beatles in the background, no? <laughs> you're kind of, we say in American English, you're kind of fat and lazy, no? There you have Juan Diego toughing it out, huh? So here's a saint, Saint Charbel Maclouf. Do you know his life? I didn't think so, so I'll tell you. <laughs> you look with a very bewildered look on your countenance there. He was canonized by the Pope that was canonized about nine days ago, Paul VI. He lived about a hundred years ago. And he was a he was a Maronite monk, okay? He's from, he was a Catholic, but it, from a different rite. From you know, di Catholics have different there are different rites. You know, the Eastern rite. And um, he was a contemplative monk. And he asked his superior if he could celebrate the mass at twelve noon. It's not what you're thinking, uh, a poor lazy guy, so he could sleep in. It wasn't for that reason, no. It, this was the reason. So he could spend the whole morning preparing for Mass. Then the whole afternoon and evening giving thanksgiving for Mass. So the whole of his life was centered on the Eucharist. Amen? Amen. Amen. The whole of his life was a preparation for the Eucharist, a receiving the Eucharist, and living out thanksgiving. Eucharist means thanksgiving. I like that. That should be our ideal. We can't do it because we're lay people and we have a lot of obligations. That should be our ideal. Everything should be focused on the Eucharist. On the Eucharist. We're holy in as much as we're exposed to the Eucharist and we receive the Eucharist. I don't know if you ever, ever told you the story that I... Uh, once a year ago, I, I, I fly about 3,000 miles to Boston, not to see the Red Sox play. I mean, I'm not a Red Sox fan. I, I happen to be a Yankee fan, but anyway, okay. Uh, I'm still going through a mourning process, but I'll get through it. Pray for my conversion. It's called uh, a lack of holy indifference, a disordered attachment, I know. <laughs> We all have ours, right? Mm -hmm. But through your prayers and your fasting, I'll be able to overcome it. <laughs> Before the Feast of Our Lady Guadalupe, hope. Mm -hmm. Maybe before Christmas, okay? If you don't pray enough, okay? okay. But I arrived, uh, and the whole week it was, it was raining. And uh, what I do when I'm in New Hampshire, I do a lot of, a lot, a lot of sports because I don't have a lot, enough time to do here. So I maybe go a little bit of golfing with my, my brothers. No? Hey, I have a question for you. Why did, why did the man take an, an extra pair of pants to the golf course? You know why? No, I don't know. Yeah, in well, case he got a hole in one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you liked that one, okay. Mm -hmm. that one? Mm -hmm. I'll explain it later. Mm -hmm. She's not the daughter of, of, of Tiger Woods, obviously, okay. Mm -hmm. um, but when, I, when, when I arrived, I like, I like to hit the, the, the rolling hills of New Hampshire, well, maybe five miles. Sometimes I've actually done 10 miles, no? I'm not, I don't have people waiting for me in the confessional. No? And I was walking the first day, and had, it was raining for four or five days. And I walked past a patch of sunflowers. How's your Spanish? Do you know how to say sunflower in Spanish? Girasol. A little bit weak in your Spanish, okay? Girasol. <laughs> now, girasol, it's a compound word. The verb is, are you good at grammar in Spanish? Hidarse is the reflexive verb, which means turn towards, soul. So what it means is turning toward the sun. 
That's exactly what a, sun, a sunflower does. If you put, place a sun where there's no, I'm sorry, a sunflower where you don't have the sun, it dies. So after a whole day, after I'd been there a whole day, when the sun came out when I arrived, it wasn't because of me. I'm not going to you know, toot my horn, okay? <laughs> so the first day I walked, the, sun, the sunflowers were drooping like that, like a, li like a weeping willow, kind of drooping. The following day, the sunflowers were like this. It made me reflect. We're like human sunflowers. We back away from the, the light of the Eucharist, we start to droop, wilt, and die. We draw close to the Eucharist, we flourish, blossom, and bring forth fruit. Amen? Amen. I thought you liked that image. Okay. So draw close to the Eucharist. So I'd like to give you three suggestions if you give me permission. Okay. Mm -hmm. Do you? Yes. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> First is um, when you can make Eucharistic visits. You cannot make your holy hour in front of the Blessed Sacrament. At least try to make Eucharistic visits. Visit the Blessed Sacrament. You know, one of the first little poems I learned when I was about six or seven, my mother taught me it, is this. Are you listening? Whenever I see a church, I stop to make a visit so that when I die, the Lord will not say, who is it? Amen? Okay. Whenever I see a church, I stop to make a visit so when I die, the Lord will not say, who is it? So visiting the Blessed Sacrament. Jesus is your best friend. Friends like to be together. Friends like to talk. This is, as we say in New York, friends like to shoot the breeze, okay? We like that friend, friendly conversations. So that's number one. Number two, Read a good book on the Eucharist. Read a good book on the Eucharist. You want to know one? Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll give you a theological text, and then I'll give you one of, of piety and devotion. Theologically, the best one would be Sacrosanta Concilium from the documents of Vatican II. That's the most important document written on the Eucharist in the past 60 years. Okay. I certainly, I certainly <laughs> will. You were reading my mind, I was planning to do it because I don't think any of you are Latin scholars, are you? No? Sacrosanta Concilium if you Google in S-A-C-C-O-N-C, -C -C, you Google that in, you will have one of the four dogmatic constitutions of Vatican II. You've heard of Vatican II, right? Yes. There were 16 documents. There are four dogmatic constitutions. And the one on the Eucharist is called Sacrosanctum Concilium, which explains the Mass and the Eucharist. It's not that long. We have a lot of intellectual scholars here tonight, right? <laughs> At least you're disguised as being one, right? Mm -hmm. That's a great reading. Another one that I really like is uh, Sophia Press, who published my first two books. And it's called The Eucharist by Father Lavasic. Published about probably 50 years ago, but it's reprinted. He does a, a, a masterful job on the Eucharist. Two other references if you want. Have you heard of the book, The Imitation of Christ? It's the second most, the second most popular book after the Bible. I'm surprised that some of you never heard of it, okay? Imitation of Christ by Kempis, okay? That's divided. 
problem is you start to get to me talk about books and never stop. You know, this problem of being an English major, right? Is the fourth part of the Imitation of Christ is dedicated to the Eucharist, Imitation of Christ, as well as the sixth book in the Diary of Saint Faustina. Remember that, okay? So that would be more piety. The other one would be devotion. So uh, the the first one is is directed more toward your, your intellect. The other is directed toward your will. You want to work on your intellect and your will. Knowledge and heart, okay? And the last suggestion I'd make is this. Try to go to Mass every day. Find time. I think all of you could probably go at least a couple of times a week. You too, I think so. It's a matter, just a, a matter of organizing your day. Here we got five daily masses, no? It's a half an hour. Now you get me, eh, 35 minutes, I like to talk. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> mm. I'm not going to let you off the hook at least for nine or ten minute homily, okay? No? <laughs> well, it's going to be 30, 35 minutes, no? Daily mass. Let me tell you this. Once you get in the habit of going daily mass, it's going to change your life. Any people here go to daily mass? How many go to daily mass? What do you think? Do you like it? Yes. Is it helpful? Yes. Can you live without it? Yes. It's almost as if if you don't have it, you feel like you're dying, right? So about half of you, I notice, raise your hand, you go to daily mass. The other half, okay, let's, uh, I'm challenging you. Find the time. And face it, we, we all waste time, we waste some time during the day. The 24 hours, there's some time that we don't use to the max. You know what'll happen though? You go to daily mass, the day is gonna go by much, much more smoothly because you're walking with the Lord. Try it. I mean, those who uh, go to the Alan Mass, you know you're talking, know what I'm talking about. Amen. Amen. So that's my, that's my, uh, my, my, my closing up of last week. I always feel that the ninth week, this ninth week, I have to give you a, a summary of last week talking about the Eucharist because it's just the topic is so important because your meditations are going to help you to make better communions. It's going to happen. Your meditations will, will upgrade, help you to make better communions. Okay, this week, we'll start out with a start out once again with a story. It was Good Friday, and this was about 60 years ago. A redemptorist priest was preaching a popular mission. What St. Anthony Mary Claret, who we celebrate today, pop, preached a lot of popular missions. It was Good Friday, and he gave to he gave to everyone. This was 60 years ago, before you had the internet. The church was was packed to the gills, and he gave everyone a little cross because it was Good Friday. And he said to the people, "Right now, I want you to lift up your cross." So, in the very back of the church, there was a lot of noise and commotion because. Uh, a lady, a married woman, was lifting up her husband. <laughs> 250 pounds of them. Right? I think she got a hernia. No? So our topic this evening is going to be the cross. So this week is going to be La Semana Santa, Holy Week. Amen? Amen. This is going to be Holy Week. So let's start off by giving you some other activities you can do to really make this to be the best week of your life. This is going to be the best week of your life. Remember the Beatles, getting better all the time, right? Okay. This is going to be the best week of your life. <coughs> Amen? Amen? So, supplementary activities 
other activity, not to supplant, but to supplement, okay? That you can do to really make this the best week of your life. Okay, are you listening? Yes. Just want to make sure, okay? Read the gospel narratives of the Passion of Christ. Know where they are? Well, I'll tell you. Free of charge. Matthew 26, 27. Mark 14, 15. Mark 14, 15. Luke 22, 23. Got that? John 18 and 19. So the, those are the eight chapters of the Passion. Got it, Erica? No. Okay. Those are the eight chapters. There are eight chapters. But there are two chapters from every evangelist. And each one is going to give you a little bit different uh, perspective. Uh, uh, John 18, 19. Now, if you, if you don't read all, all four of the gospel, now, at least read one of them. So you can get the whole, the whole um, perspective of where we're at. Because first and foremost, the, the, these exercises, as you know, are very biblical. 90% of my program is basically biblical passages with specific gr graces and topics that you're meditating upon. Okay. Uh, next would be, see if you can make the way of the cross. Have you done that? Stations of the cross. Make sure that you, you make the stations of the cross at least once. Better yet, every day if you can. Some of you are looking at me with somewhat uh, a bewildered countenance, if I'd have to say, no? Uh, so I'll make it easier to understand. If you go into our church, okay, during the day before, before 5 o'clock, uh, 4.30, when the, when the sun is still out, we have among, probably, among the most beautiful stations of the cross in the stained glass windows in L.A. They're really beautiful. Some of you don't, maybe you haven't come to our church that often, but the church is very beautiful. But if you go from the door where you have St. Therese, and you, you make like a semicircle, you've got seven of those stations. Then you go to the other side where you've got the organ, you've got the other seven stations. And they're beautiful. And it's very Ignatian because Ignatian says that we try to utilize our imagination. We fill our imagination with holy images. Okay? Uh, you, you can spend an hour on that, or you can spend 15 minutes. When I do it, it usually takes 15 minutes because I go, I don't read a book, I just go, I look, I contemplate, then I talk spontaneously to our Lord and the Blessed Mother. You can read a book if you want. The best would be St. Alfonso Liguori. But if you prefer just to look at it and then talk spontaneously, to each his own, huh? Okay, uh, next uh, would be this. Invite the Blessed Mother to be with you. And of course, you pray, try to pray the rosary every day, but this week you want to be praying the Sorrowful Mysteries, which you meditated, the Sorrowful Mysteries, the agony of our Lord in the garden, the scourging at the pillar, crowning with thorns, carrying of the cross, crucifixion and death of our Lord. Meditate upon the Sorrowful Mysteries. I'm going to give you a lot of ideas. Then the, you can meditate on the seven sorrows of Mary. 
should be. If you bought my book, you should know them. It's a part of my, my last book, you should know them. If you read my book, you got a good memory. The Prophecy of Simeon. The Flight into Egypt. The Loss of the Child Jesus in the Temple. Jesus meets Mary on the way of Calvary. The Crucifixion and Mary witnessing the Crucifixion. The Pieta of Michelangelo in which Jesus is lowered into the arms of Mary. And the seventh would be the separation of Jesus from Mary when he was buried. Those are the seven sorrows of Mary. Got that? More or less, okay? Okay, then next. Now, if Ignatius were living, I really believe that he would strongly recommend this. Some good movies. Uh, so I'll mention that, not that you have to do all of this, but, but hopefully you'll be able to do a few things that I'm suggesting, so this is going to be the best week. Now, the movie of the Mysteries of the Rosary by Father Patrick Payton is probably the most faithful to the gospel you're ever going to see in a movie. Family Theater, Father Patrick Payton. And also, if you just go on YouTube, you'll be able to, you'll be able to see it on YouTube. Father Patrick Payton, who said the family that prays together stays together. And a world at prayer is a world at peace. Those are the immortal sayings of Father Patrick Payton. That's one. Another one, especially if you have some Hispanic blood within your veins, is called Marcelino Panavino. Any of you ever hear that? Marcelino Panavino. In English, a miracle. Uh, it, okay, okay, Marcelino Panavino. So it's Marcelino would be the name of the little boy. Pan would be bread and wine. That is a great movie to see. Now, get the older version, one made in, in, in Spain or Mexico. This one came out maybe about five years ago. It was terrible. It was like, you know, rob, you know, cowboys and Indians, you know, with a lot of violence, you know. It was really, it was perverted, really. And I went to see that. This is terrible. It was like a, really a, a falsification of, of the real original movie. But the original movie, it's a story about this little orphan boy that's left at the steps of these Franciscan monks. They decide to adopt him in a bassinet, no? And then little kid, when he's about four or five years old, he can walk, he climbs up to an upper room, and he opens up his eyes, and he sees there on the wall this huge graphic crucifix. And he starts to talk to Jesus on the cross, and Jesus responds. So they start to talk and they start to get to know each other. Isn't that what we're trying to do in these exercises, trying to get to know Christ? Yeah. Then he goes back another time, always uh, you know, behind the backs of these Franciscans. And he talks to him again and then Jesus is responding. And he goes back a third time. And he noticed that this man is kind of cold, doesn't have any clothes, so he goes to his room and he gives him his, his blanket. So he's going to be suffering the cold of the night. Let Jesus have his blanket. So given that his, his bones are jutting out, he, that, guy, that guy's kind of skinny. Skinny people are pretty, probably hungry, no? And the kid's he's pretty smart for a five-year-old. Right? So he goes into the kitchen and on the sly, he absconds with the, with the bread. Uh, Panevino. 
and he gives Jesus some bread and he eats it and he thanks him and their conversation going deeper and deeper. You ever eat dry bread, you're going to be thirsty. Try to eat dry bread tonight, you're going to be thirsty. Right? So what he does is he's, he's a, no, a dry bread, he's probably thirsty. He, he goes into the kitchen and brings him wine. Pan y vino. No, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of like pan de vino, yeah? That divine bread, right? That would be the Eucharist, right? Yeah. <laughs> so he brings him some pan y vino, bread and wine. And every time he's doing these gestures, the friendship is going deeper and deeper and deeper. Isn't that what we're aiming at in these exercises? What do you think? Trying to go deeper? Working at it? You too? Mm -hmm. Then he notices, because the little boy has a heart filled with compassion, he notices that on Jesus' head, there's this crown of thorns. That, that must be pretty sharp. That must be pretty painful. What does he do? He gets a ladder, climbs up the ladder with his little hands, Right, not that easy. You can probably prick yourself, huh? So he's risking, since suffering the passion of Christ, to shed his own little blood for Jesus, right? So he takes the crown off his head. But you know, we all have, we all have a thorn in our heart. We all have our hidden sufferings which is something we're afraid to open up because we're afraid that someone won't understand us if we open up our hidden wounds. So after going deep into the relationship with Christ, he opens up his heart and says, Jesus, do you have a mother? Oh, yes. What's your mother like? Oh, she's very kind and loving and merciful, compassionate. Yes. Where is she? She's with me. She's in heaven. Can I see her? Do you really want to see her? Yes. In that moment, there's thunder and lightning, and the little boy falls back, and the little boy dies. But he's taken up into heaven to be in the arms of Mary, his heavenly mother. That's all the purpose of these exercises. Unless you become like a little child, you can't enter the kingdom of heaven, Jesus says. Yeah. You're called to be Marcelina Panavino. You're called to really to get to know Christ. You're called to contemplate him. You're called to console him. You're called to give him your covers called to give him the pane vino. You're called to, to take that crown off his head. You're called to meet the one he loved most, Mother Mary. As the Filipinos say, Mama Mary. Right? If you can understand that, these exercises will change your life. Because up to this point, Jesus is there, but somewhat distant, he's going to be real. He's going to be alive. He's going to be your best friend. He's going to be your lover. He's going to give meaning to your life. All of your life has meaning in relation to Jesus on the cross. But he died, but also he rose from the dead. Amen? Amen. So let me give you the fruit you're going to be begging for, then I'll give you a, a brief Ignatian contemplation. What are you going to be begging for? It's a tough grace. You're going to be begging for the grace to be able to suffer with Jesus. 
suffer with Jesus. Maybe one of the best words that you can coin related to this is compassion. Compassion. Compassion is a compound Latin word. And it basically means cum passio, it means suffering with. You go to the, the etymology of the word, cum passio, suffer with. Willingness to suffer with Christ. You know, I was about um, maybe about 13. Uh, one of my father's uh, colleagues uh, died of uh, you know, pancreatic cancer. He came really quickly. And he said something I never forgot. He said, I've got to go to the funeral. And I said, Dad, why do you have to go? Sometimes you have to simply go to funerals where you don't even know what to say, but your presence is enough. Good teacher, huh? I was 13. And I didn't really understand. I was thinking, you don't want to go to that. And he said, I got to go. What are you going to say? Probably nothing. I'm just going to be present there to empathize with the wife and his kids. It's really what the Blessed Virgin Mary did underneath the cross, right? She was there present. And of all the hymns of the Passion of Christ, Jacobi di Todi, which is called the Stabat Mater, with about 30 different verses, is probably the most famous in the world. Right, Kristen? Yes, Father. Okay. It's about 30 different verses. And we sing it on Good Friday, but in which the, this Italian author, Jacobi di Todi, is his name, he penned some of the most beautiful, poetic, mystical verses on the Passion of Christ ever written. Jacobi di Todi, how's your Italian? But you can get in English or Italian or Latin, whatever language you want. So you're going to be begging for the grace to suffer with Christ. You don't want to be a fair weather friend. You know what that means? Okay, that's it's probably a New York expression. Fair weather friends means you're a friend only in the good times. Just at the party, but not at the funeral. You like the parties and the fiesta. Funeral, you back off. You got to be there in the good times as well as the difficult times. It's easier for us to be there at the wedding feast of Canaan, not to be drinking the wine. But to be there when Jesus is suffering more difficult. So I'd like to give you um, I'd like to give you a short Ignatian contemplation. And it's invite all of you to, to be with to, to be with the Blessed Virgin Mary at the foot of the cross. That's what the Latin stabit mater means. Mary was present there at the foot of the cross. But instead of the visual depiction, I'd like to present you the, the words of Jesus. Do you know that the, at the end of the life of Jesus, he, he spoke seven times from the cross. Seven times. It's called the seven last words. And probably no one has ever done a more masterful depiction of this than Fulton Sheen. Fulton Sheen wrote about 70 books. For many years, and the New Yorkers here in the church, church of St. Agatha in Manhattan, he preached it every year, probably for 25 years. And of course, the church would be packed to the gills, no? Fulton Sheen. 
So I'll, I'll, get, I'll go through the, the seven last words. And this, will, this is going to be part of this week and try to give you the whole tone, flavor of this week. Fulton Sheen says with the seven last words, Jesus ascended the pulpit of the cross and he gave his most eloquent sermon from the cross. From the pulpit of the cross, because it almost looks like a pulpit there where he is standing, right? So I'll give you the, each one, and each one I'll give you a short idea. You ready? So the first word of Jesus would be, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they're doing. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they're doing. Okay, what is the message here? It is mercy and forgiveness. Mercy and forgiveness. Now, if you, if, you, if, you, if you really meditate upon this, what has happened to Jesus? They put this crown of thorns on his head. They spat in his face. They punched him. Shortly before that, they took his clothes off and they whipped him. Basically, his body was a gaping wound. He's abandoned by his apostles. He's treated like, a, like, like an animal by Herod. Pontius Pilate, the big coward, knows that he's, he's innocent, but because he, wanted a, he was a people pleaser more than a God pleaser, he gave him over to the, to the will of the Jews. I mean, he basically treated worse than anyone was ever treated in the history of the world. I mean, he's by the Jews, by the Romans, his apostles abandoned him. Judas goes off to, to, to betray him for 30 pieces of silver, the price of a slave. And the first thing he says is, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they're doing. That's huge. You hear that and say, well, that sounds nice, but you, you, have, to, you have to hear what I just said. Someone does something very small to us, and we're not going to talk to that person for 48 hours, no? When someone doesn't smile at you, mm -hmm. <laughs> where he says an unkind word my dignity has been offended I'm not going to talk to my husband for 48 hours <laughs> and talk about pride and look what happened to Jesus Jesus the son of God and he's, he's treated like an animal his, his body is an open wound and the first thing he says father forgive them kind of almost excusing what they're doing because they don't know what they're doing that's huge the next time you're hurt or offended, remember that. You know? you're swallow, your, you're gonna swallow your pride. You, know? you do that, we're going to grow in humility. You know? And when people hurt us, sometimes we deserve it. Yeah. Well, sometimes, we deserve, or sometimes we even deserve more. Jesus is God. He's innocent. He's the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Second word. They say a word, but it's a short, it's a short says, uh, phrase. Two words. I thirst. Now, obviously, I, I'm not a nurse or a doctor, but I, I have a little bit of common sense. If you lose a lot of blood, if you're walking underneath the hot sun, you haven't drank in anything for 12, 24 hours. You're probably going to be thirsty. What do you think? A dying of thirst. So when you read, especially through the Gospel of St. John, there's two levels. There's the physical level, then there's the deeper, deeper spiritual level. What he really thirsted for, he thirsted for two things. For your love, and for the salvation of souls. Yeah. For your love. The salvation of souls.
You know, one of the most painful things, this is written in literature, Shakespeare and some of the classics, is when love is not corresponded to. So you, you love your son to death and he rejects you. Broken heart, right? It's happened to some of you. I mean, you love your, your, you love your son to death almost. And he just treats with you indifference. The, the, the classical poets call it the broken heart syndrome. Huh? So Jesus, he, he wants your love. Don't be cold and indifferent. Tell him you love him. You see him hanging on the cross. Lord, I love you. Thank you for you've loved me so much. Tell him. Now this is Ignatius now. Think about, think about all the, the, the gruesome, excruciating details of what he suffered. I'm just giving you one element, and I didn't mention the film of Mel Gibson, which would be, of course, the best to watch, The Passion of the Christ. Maybe you've seen it. Now, think about everything they suffered, The Passion of the Christ. If you were... If you were the only person in the whole world, Jesus would have suffered all that for you. How important you are. For you too. And for you. How could you possibly meditate upon that without your, your eyes welling up with tears? For me, as a Christian, a Catholic, and a priest, that's what touches me most of my whole, my whole faith. Now, you know, I've got a degree in theology, all these studies and all of that. What really touches me most is that I recognize that all the excruciating suffering, Jesus shedding every drop of his precious blood, he did it for me. How much he loves me. And that motivates me, like St. Anthony Mary, Mary Claret, to work hard to save souls. I thirst for your love, thirst for the salvation of souls. What are we going to do to save souls? That's what motivates the saints to do great things. It's a love for Jesus crucified, and if we love Jesus, we should love what he loves, the salvation of souls. You don't want to be indifferent toward love. The heart breaks. We hear these words, but we go through them quickly. You have to someone that explains these words to us, like a priest, like a preacher, like a writer, like Fulton Sheen. Then he said, These are the most mysterious words that, that I've battled with for the past 50 years. Eloi, Eloi, Lama Sabakani. I have difficulty with those words. Those are the words in Aramaic, in, in English, would be Jesus says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's hard to understand. My God, my God, why have you, why have you forsaken me? Why have you abandoned me? Well, I, 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 I said them in English. You don't have to know them in Latin. Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, because you get, from Matthew, you got the, you got the Aramaic version. If you want a brief theological explanation, I'll give it to you from Fulton Sheen. Okay, Jesus has two natures, right? The divine nature and the human nature and the one person. In the divine nature, there's no, there, there's no, abandonment of Jesus with God the Father, but in his human nature there's an eclipse. In his human nature. Because Jesus as the Son of God, he's always going to contemplate the face of his Father. But as in human nature, there's, you know what an eclipse is? When the sun is blocked, it's like there's an eclipse. Okay? You can't see your face. So there was, a, there was an eclipse. Now practically for us, we all go through desolation, dark times. Stay close to the Blessed Mother. She'll help you. Through those dark tunnels, she'll never abandon you. 
You may feel that God is far away. Stay close to Mary. She'll help you through the darkest times. Remember that. The next word. Jesus looks down from the cross. And he contemplates the two people that he loved most. And they were? John. John and the Blessed Mother, right? Those are the two people loved most. Because her husband has already died. St. Joseph has passed away. But his best friend is John, and his mother's there. And he says these words. You know? Woman, behold thy son. Son, behold thy mother. And from that moment, the beloved disciple took Mary into his home. So there are, there are two interpretations to that. There's the literal and the, the, then there's the spiritual. The literal is that Mary has lost her husband, now she's going to lo lose her only, only son. Where's she going to go? So what is Jesus doing? He's providing for his mother. He's going to give his mother to John, who's going to be taking Mary into his physical home, but even more important, into the spiritual home of his soul. That being the case, the Catholic Church has always taken that passage to be that in the person of John is every one of us. From the cross, looking at John, Jesus was thinking about every one of us that Mary is going to be our spiritual mother. That's a good Catholic interpretation of the passage. How much Mary loves Jesus, how much Mary loves the church, how much Mary loves you and you and you and me. Your heart should melt with love that Mary loves us so much. Now, I think you're a mother. You are too, right, Gabrielle? Are you a mother? Okay, put, put all, this is St. Augustine now, put all the love of all the mothers of all times together. The love that Mary has for you is much greater. That staggers the imagination. And that's not exaggeration either. And so put all the loves of all the mothers of all time together. The love that Mary has for you is much greater. So when you're ever, in the, you're, you're ever down into the dumps of desolation, remember that. So there from the cross, Mary saw John, but Mary saw you. You too, Etika. You too. He saw you. He saw you too. And she gave us a lot of peace and a lot of... We're not alone. In the midst of the hardships of life, we're not alone. <laughs> we got Mary at our side. How thankful we should be to be Catholics, having Mary at our side. Our life, our sweetness, and our hope, right? Then, one of the most touching scenes in the film of Mel Gibson is you have those two thieves, right? The one on the left, one on the right. And they first, they start to attack Jesus, both of them. But one of, it, one of them is moved by grace. And he turns to his companion and says, look, we're here because we deserve this. 
This man is innocent. Done no evil. And he turns to Jesus and says some of the most moving words in the history of the world. Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said, He said, Amen, amen, I say to you, today you'll be with me in paradise. Amen, amen, I say to you, today you'll be with me in paradise. And as Fulton Sheen says, Fulton Sheen says, He died a thief because he stole heaven. Amen? <laughs> he died a thief because he stole heaven. How do you interpret that? This guy, he was a thief. He was a murderer. He was an insurrectionist. You know what that is? He started the wars. Hitler type. Start a horse. In comparison with him, the chose of wine garden look like mujercitas. I mean, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> and this, this guy was a, he was a tough guy, but he was converted by the love and mercy of Jesus Christ. Now, how can we connect with this? Jesus says to St. Faustina, the prayer that's most pleasing to Jesus is to pray for the conversion of sinners, especially deathbed sinners. What I try to do as best I possibly can is when I'm going to a hospital or a home, when someone is sick and very in the prison time. What I try to do, I try to, I try to live out that word. People are dying. Jesus was dying. These thieves were dying. Got to get people to heaven? What do I do? I try as a priest, hear their confession, give them the anointing of the sick, and give them Holy Communion so that these people can die and go to heaven. Now you can't do that because you're not a priest. And you never will be. But you can do something very special. Someone is dying, pray the chaplet to my mercy. Do it. Pray the rosary. You know what the promise that Jesus has in the, in the diary of St. Faustina? Someone is dying. You pray the chaplet to my mercy, Jesus promises that that person will be saved. Never forget that. Never forget that. Even if the person is a person that's not practicing his Catholic faith. Even if the person is another religion. Even if the person is an atheist. That's incredible. Atheist, someone doesn't even believe in God. How can you explain that? Explain it because this is what happens. You're praying that, and you pray that prayer. What happens is Jesus is looking at his son. He's looking at his son with those wounds in his hands, the wounds in his feet, and the dripping blood, and God the Father cannot resist that. He's not so much looking at the sinner there dying in the bed. He's looking at his son dying on the bed of the cross offering his whole being to God the Father. Father, forgive them because they do not know what they're doing. You people can be instrumental in saving many souls if you believe this. If you believe. So I'm trying to connect these wonderful, powerful meditations to the salvation of souls. 
you really love Jesus, you love what he loves, the salvation of souls. Yes. Then Jesus on the cross, he's, all, he's dying now. He says, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Into, my, into your hands I commend my spirit. Now we should be praying for ourselves that we'll be able to commend our spirit into the hands of God the Father like Jesus and that when we die, we will all be saved. We will be saved. It's not important a long life or a short life, riches or poverty, health or sickness, honors or humiliations. What's important is that we've got to make it to heaven. And his last words, the last words of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ were, it is finished. Then breathing forth his spirit, Jesus died. So I conclude with this last consideration. If you were the only person the only person living in this world, Jesus, he would have sweat bled blood for you. He would have been scourged for you. He would have been crowned with thorns for you. He would have carried his heavy cross for you. He would have been nailed to the cross for you. He would have shed every drop of his precious blood for you. That's how important, that's how precious you are and your soul is for Jesus Christ. So I hope and pray that this is going to be the best week in your life because you're going to be contemplating the great love that Jesus had for every one of you here present. So do this meditation with the Blessed Virgin Mary at your side every step along the way. Amen. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and bless the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for our sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Glory be to the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. A lady of sorrows, pray for us. Pray for us. Have a great week.